from Cal Poly Pomona. Please put your hands together for Dr. Soraya M. Cooley. Raising my voice, if that is what it takes to be heard, is not being a hysterical female. Declaring my anger without apology is not being a bitchy female. Allowing myself to feel my rage when I am confronted with abuses of power that reduce human beings to things, I am not a bleeding heart. Well, actually, I am being a bleeding heart, and freely I choose to let my heart be wounded by such outrageous behavior. I am a woman who seeks to see and tell the truth. I am a woman who seeks to speak from my center and to name what I see in the service of healing, in the service of life, and in the service of love. I am a woman who has experienced the power of words and language to tear down and diminish or to build up and honor. I am a woman who struggles to use language as a vehicle for both, for tearing down what separates us and for building up what unites us, for diminishing our fears of each other and for honoring the holy mystery that is each unique person. Using language clearly and forcefully is one of the ways in which I become more powerful. It is my right, and I will no longer be intimidated by the voices of others who seek to silence me. I am a woman using my voice to create change. Good morning. Thank you so much for inviting me to participate in the 10th annual The State of Women event in conjunction with Women's History Month. I commend May Mayor Robertson, Ms. McGee, and other individuals and organizations that have joined together to organize this event and to honor women in public service and government. I'm pleased to also see Senator Leva Assemblywoman Brown, and my own uh, city representative for the whole area, Congresswoman Norma Torres, who epitomizes the power of public service. This essential sector in our society is so vital to the progress of our communities, our state, and indeed the nation. I opened with a passage I am a woman using my voice to create change, taken from Janet Quinn's book, I am a woman finding my voice. And I think the passage reflects the varied experiences and struggles of women in seeking to affirm our humanity, our talents, and our strengths. When my office was contacted about today's program, I was asked to share a little something about my personal and professional journey. And so whenever I am asked to do such, or I'm introduced, uh, or there's a written uh, biography, I'm often reminded of a particular experience with my grandmother. I grew up in the segregated South of North Carolina and was blessed with a strong sense of community and with family and others in my life who carried high expectations for my achievement. I was the first in my mother's family to have attended college, and as I would visit my grandmother during my college years, she was so proud that I was going beyond high school as she had only gone to the sixth grade. And when I graduated from college, of course, she wanted to know, when was I going to get a job? I explained to her that I was going beyond college to get a master's degree, and she wanted to know what was I planning to be the master of. <laughs> and the questions concerning when I was going to get a job persisted through my master's and on into my doctoral studies. 
So I finally completed my doctoral degree and I go to visit my grandmother to share the good news. And unbeknownst to me, she invited two of her friends, Miss Sally Bett and Miss Lula May, to come see her granddaughter who was now a doctor. She'd also told them to bring their medicines so I could determine whether their doctors had properly diagnosed them. Now, if you can imagine a scene with me, 30 years old or so forth, sitting there trying to explain to these three women, age 83, 89, and 91, what a PhD, a doctor in philosophy was, well, it was quite humbling. And as her two friends left, my grandmother apologetically said to her friends, she may be a doctor, but she ain't a real doctor. <laughs> so that always is a wonderful reminder of keeping perspective and asking how does what you do bring meaning and benefit to others. Unfortunately, my grandmother is no longer with me, but I think she would be proud that I finally have a job. And I am sure that my journey is not so unique for many of you. It has not been a straight, direct, on track, always knowing where you're going journey. Rather, it is a journey that's been informed by the love and prayers of family, by learning the lessons from the missteps, by always growing, being resilient and persistent, and by mentors, teachers, colleagues, loved ones who sometimes could see in me what I was unable to see at the time. And with their belief in me as a backdrop, I would take a leap of faith. I joined California State University system in 1981 as a lecturer at Cal State Fullerton. Having grown up in North Carolina and attended college and graduate school in Pennsylvania, I worked for a while in New York but absolutely none of that prepared me for landing in Orange County, California in 1981. My husband was a Marine Corps officer and pilot and was transferred to the then helicopter base in Tustin, California. And of course, he had a ready-made environment to go to enter. I had informed family and friends that we were moving to LA because I thought that's what Southern California meant, LA. But I was wrong. So the first day I arrived in Orange County, I got into the car and drove around until I finally did end up in Los Angeles and then had the traffic coming back to Orange County. So needless to say, when I got home, I asked him where in the world had he brought me. I was distressed that I also had not found a place to get my hair done. And we're talking about important stuff here. So I started at Cal State Fullerton, and there I was excited to start a new position right after, gotten, after obtaining my doctorate. Cal State Fullerton was also an adjustment. Fortunately, I found a support system and great mentors across the university, including the then President Jewel Plummer Cobb, an African-American woman, my dean, other senior faculty and administrators. And it was my 20-year experience at Cal State Fullerton that really fostered the personal and professional growth and advancement I have experience. My Fullerton experience also reinforced my need to develop a sense of purpose. It was there that I became clear of my commitment to providing a high quality education to help others achieve social and economic mobility and to support the personal growth and development of others. I am reminded oftentimes of the statement that People should pull, pull themselves up by their own bootstraps. And I remind people that someone gave them boots and someone gave them straps. We're not born knowing this. 
and part of our responsibility, if we're so fortunate, is to pass it on. And as I advanced along the tenure track, I became a full professor. I imagined that I would always be in the classroom and never gave any thought to administration. And I've come to appreciate that we often come to our leadership roles in different ways, and there is no right path. Some of us are what I call reluctant leaders. No one else would do it, and it seems like it might be interesting, so we assume the role and we begin to commit to it. For me, that is how I began. My husband was then stationed at Headquarters Marine Corps in Washington, D.C., and so I took a two-year leave from Cal State Fullerton. But in order to have my department support my leave, they said that I had to come back and be department chair when I returned. And so that was never something I had in my vision, but I did come back and there I assumed the position and worked very hard to build and in fact extend the department into the community. Soon after that, I was encouraged by the faculty in the school to apply for the deanship at Fullerton, where I served for four years in that role. And so I was what you would call a reluctant leader. And then there are those bold leaders. These are the ones that have declared they're going to be a supervisor, a director, or a college president by 2020. These are the individuals who have mapped out their pathway and it is about one role leading to the next. And then there's what I call the confident leaders. They may end up as a director or a vice president or even a president, but they are confident in whatever their current position is, reflective about their strengths and weaknesses, and are willing to explore other options if or when they happen to present themselves. But there were several individuals who proclaimed when I was a faculty member that one day I would be a college president. And not being able to see around my professional development corner, I thanked them for their observations and routinely denied that such would ever happen. Over time, I came to appreciate the importance of mentors and guides who can see in you sometimes what you cannot see in yourself. And that is what I have proclaimed as our focus at Cal Poly Pomona, to be a Geiger counter for talent. It's not just the obvious on the surface talent, but that hidden talent that, will, that we will cultivate because we see the potential in our students. I value the individuals who came into my life as they held a mirror up to me to say, I want you to see what we see in you. And we all have the opportunity in working with youth and young adults to help them see the talent and the need for their gifts. And today, more than ever, our gifts of leadership and service are needed. They need us to understand the challenges and the changes and to help navigate new courses and uncertain channels. They need what Cashman refers to as mastery in six areas. The first area is personal mastery, which deals with an ongoing commitment to unfolding and authentically expressing who you are. Personal mastery is especially essential as we need to avoid buying into those negative beliefs that others have of us. And I think women many times have those shadow beliefs that either evaluate ourselves too harshly or evaluate others, especially women, too critically. I often say to women that you must believe that you are enough to meet the challenges before you. You are enough in helping to advance that department or that program. You are enough to help transform our institutions. And you are enough to join with others in solving the problems of the 21st century. 
And being enough does not preclude the need for being a part of or having a strong team working towards a common purpose. It does not mean that you no longer grow or that you don't recognize the areas of improvement needed. Nor does it mean believing, as the young women used to say, that you think that you're all that. No, being enough means having the resolve, the confidence, and the fortitude to move forward in spite of the obstacles, the self-doubt, and the challenges. It means being authentic because it is the specialness of your gift that the you is really revealed. Know your gifts, cultivate, expand, analyze, critique, and modify your gifts, but recognize that your gifts are needed on the gift table of society. Yet many times as women, we're less assertive about recognizing our gifts. We deliberate on giving just the perfect gift. And once we select it, we wrap our gifts in plain paper, and to be less noticed, we won't add a bow. Or we place the gift under other gifts. We compare the size of our gift on the table with the big box in the center. And when our gift is open, we hope that it is liked or the right color, or while we're being complimented because of our gift, we begin apologizing and letting the person know that they can take it back and exchange it. I say, give your gift, know your gift, and recognize that it is needed. Let me share a passage from Marianne Williamson on realizing your gift. Our deepest fear is not that we are inadequate. Our deepest fear is that we are powerful beyond measure. It is our light, not our darkness, that most frightens us. We ask ourselves, who am I to be brilliant, gorgeous, talented, and fabulous? Actually, who are you not to be? Your playing small doesn't serve the world. There's nothing enlightened about shrinking so that other people won't feel insecure around you. As we let our own light shine, we unconsciously give other people permission to do the same. As we are liberated from our own fear, our presence automatically liberates others. The second area is purpose mastery. How do you express your gifts to make a difference? People are blessed if they have clarity early on about their purpose. I did not but it became increasingly clear as I reflected on what brought me the greatest satisfaction, and that was contributing to the development and transformation of others. And as I progressed from department chair to a dean to a vice president, at each turn I had a clear sense of direction and purpose in providing access and opportunity to education. The next is change mastery. There's a saying that we have no choice in the matter of whether change will occur, only whether we can master our ability to adapt to change. How are we open to the learning that is contained in all change? What are our coping resources in the midst of change? And what role can we play to help institutions change? What is our own resiliency quotient towards addressing the issues in our personal and professional life? Each of us has only one choice. How do we choose to respond to the ebbs and flows of life? We all face difficulties and challenges, but we don't all respond in the same way. And that is often the difference in the quality of our life. Is this loss, this problem, the defining moment for your future? Will I stay in the valley or will I walk through the valley? And of course, it's easier said than done. 
The fourth area of mastery is interpersonal mastery. That is fostering and developing the interpersonal relationships that support you in attaining your goals. I have been fortunate to have individuals who have mentored me throughout my career. You must identify those who demonstrate the character and values that are compatible with yours. I have often have young people reflect on the individuals they allow into their lives. Are they uplifting or do they bring you down? The next is balance mastery. It is imperative to have a reference point both within and outside. An outside mentor who can be a mirror and support your exploration of balanced perspectives. It is important to have someone help process with you. Am I totally missing this or what? But not everyone has the right or the privilege to help you sort through that. The final is action mastery, which is an ongoing commitment to go beyond what you thought was possible because you have a sense of purpose. One of my favorite gifts that was given to me by a staff member when I was provost and vice president at CSU Bakersfield, it was the book the little engine that could. She said that throughout the budget downturns, throughout the anxious times, you would not let us give up, be victims, or feel helpless. We were going to work together to do our best with whatever we had because others depended on us. So wherever you may be in your personal or professional life, Know that your contributions are needed. I believe that women will bring to the leadership role an ability to reframe the challenges and thereby foster the inspiration and motivation needed to move ahead. We understand the benefits of working collaboratively and will be able to promote the policies and structures needed to deal with the challenging reality and we will maintain the moral compass needed for serving the underserved, the underprepared, and the non-traditional. In closing, I'd like to share with you one of my favorite passages. It reflects a personal journey that I believe many of us share, and it is called the awakening. A time comes into your life when you finally get it when in the midst of all your fears and insanity, you stop dead in your tracks, and somewhere the voice inside your head cries out, enough. Enough fighting and crying and blaming and struggling to hold on. And then, like a child quieting down after a tantrum, you blink back your tears and begin to look at the world through new eyes. This is your awakening. You realize it is time to stop hoping and waiting for something to change or for happiness, safety, and security to magically appear over the next horizon. You realize that in the real world there are always fairy tale endings and that any guarantee of happily ever after must begin with you and in the process a sense of serenity is born of acceptance. You awaken to the fact that you are not perfect and that not everyone will always love, appreciate, or approve of who or what you are, and that is okay. They are entitled to their own views and opinions. You learn the importance of loving and championing yourself and in the process, a sense of newfound confidence is born of self-approval. You stop complaining and blaming other people for the things they did to you or didn't do for you, and you learn that the only thing you can really count on is the unexpected. You learn that people don't always say what they mean or mean what they say, and that not everyone will always be there for you and that everything isn't always about you. So you learn to stand on your own, and you take care of yourself, 
and in the process, a sense of safety and security is born of self-reliance. You stop judging and pointing fingers, and you begin to accept people as they are and to overlook their shortcomings and human frailties. And in the process, a sense of peace and contentment is born in the forgiveness. You learn to open up to new worlds and different points of view. You begin reassessing and redefining who you are and what you really stand for. You learn the difference between wanting and needing, and you begin to discard the doctrines and values you've outgrown or should never have bought into begin with. You begin, you learn that principles such as honesty and integrity are not the outdated ideals of a bygone era, but the mortar that holds together the foundation upon which you must build a life. And then you learn about love. You learn to look at relationships as they really are and not as you would have them to be. You learn that alone does not mean lonely. You stop trying to control people, situations, and outcomes. You learn to distinguish between guilt and responsibility and the importance of setting boundaries and learning to say no. You learn that your body really is your temple and you begin to care for it and treat it with respect. And you learn that being tired fuels doubt, fear, and uncertainty, and so you take more time to rest. And just as food fuels the body, laughter fuels our soul, so you take more time to laugh and play. You learn that for the most part, you get in life what you believe you deserve, and that much of life is truly self-fulfilling prophecy. You learn that anything worth achieving is worth working for, and that wishing for something to happen is different than working towards making it happen. You also learn that no one can do it alone, and that it is okay to risk asking for help. You learn that the only thing you must truly fear is fear itself. You learn to step right into and through your fears because you know that whatever happens, you can handle it. And to give into fear is to give away the right to love life on your own terms. You learn that life isn't always fair. You don't always get what you think you deserve and that sometimes bad things happen to unsuspecting good people and you learn to not always take it personally. You learn that nobody's punishing you and everything isn't always somebody else's fault. It's just life happening. You learn to admit when you are wrong and to build bridges instead of walls. And you learn that negative feelings such as anger, envy, and resentment must be understood and redirected or they will suffocate the life out of you and poison the universe that surrounds you. You learn to be thankful and to take comfort in many of the simple things we take for granted, things that millions of people upon the earth can only dream about. A full refrigerator, clean running water, a soft warm bed, a long hot shower. You make it a point to keep smiling, to keep trusting, and to stay open to every wonderful possibility. Thank you very much.